In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God, our Father, we, uh, we begin this day uh, in your presence, and we're, we're so truly grateful for everything that you give us, the, the gift of life, uh, the gift of faith, uh, the gift of uh, the church and the chance to be together and to encourage one another on our journey of faith. We thank you for this uh, food for the soul gathering. And Lord, in that gratitude, we ask that you would uh, strengthen our faith, deepen our love for you, uh, lift us up uh, in our more difficult moments so that we can, in fact, bring you into the world, that we can help build your kingdom on this earth, that we can allow your light to shine through us into this world that is filled with so much darkness. Today we also uh, pray f for uh, a greater commitment in our country to build a, a culture of life where the dignity of every human being is respected. And we ask all of this prayer humbly and with great confidence through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So uh, a business owner is opening up a, a brand new uh, store and uh, first, first new store and very excited. And one of his uh, best friends sends uh, flowers to the store for this opening ceremony. And he, you know, he goes and he looks and, and the, the card says, uh, rest in peace. And, and he's not happy at all. The owner is not happy. And he calls up the florist and he says, come on, man, I'm opening up this brand new store and you're sending me, you know, the wrong flowers. What's up with that? Rest in peace. And the, the owner says, listen, I'm, gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I, I, you know, I don't know what happened. I'm so sorry. But I really need you to think about, you know, what's going on. Somewhere uh, around the country, there's, there's a funeral. And someone's going to open up these flowers that are going to say, uh, congratulations on your new location. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, since 1972, the Catholic bishops in the United States have uh, set aside October as Respect Life Month. And it's an invitation to pray for and to renew our resolve as uh, Americans and, and as Catholics here in America uh, to, to bring about a culture of life uh, and an end to this um, sense that, that, uh, that we can just take life when uh, maybe... Uh, we don't feel that it has the, the, um, the quality of life that we deem is important or if it is a burden to us in some significant way or because it's weak enough that I can take advantage of it or whatever the case may be. And uh, the theme that the bishops have chosen for this year is, is be not afraid. And... Um, you know, I think one of the ways of uh, informing our minds and consciences on this issue that's really important is through the sacred scriptures. Now, it's not the only way. And in fact, uh, this reality or, or even we could say these arguments are, uh, don't work for non-believers to, to focus on the sacred scriptures. Uh, and there are plenty of of ways of looking at this or arguments, if you may, uh, purely from the use of reason, quite frankly, that one can use to, uh, to comprehend and raise up the dignity of, of human life without the use of faith. There's plenty of good arguments out there. Um, but for Jews and for Christians, I think it's really important to, to turn to the scriptures and so what I would like to do for a few moments this morning is actually to briefly sketch a picture of the dignity of human life as brought up in the scriptures. And of course, the first place that we have to go um, without question is to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. 
uh, where, I mean, there, there's plenty of profound and beautiful things that are said there, uh, revealed to us, but one of the most important of which is this, the line, um, God created man in his image, in the divine image he created him, male and female he created them. And what we get a, a really clear sense from in the book of Genesis is that, uh, you know, human beings, man and woman, are uh, different from all of the rest of creation. Uh, it describes creation in, in some beautiful ways, but it never says of any of God's creation except for human beings that they were made in God's image and likeness. And so uh, we are unique among creation because of that. And that um, as a result of this reality and, and the way in which we've kind of come to understand the meaning of that, uh, to summarize it real quickly, um, that this image is manifested in the reality that, that we are unique, every one of us is unique, that we were made for love, that we have been given freedom to choose, which again makes us so different from the rest of creation. And that we are capable of rational thought most of the time, maybe not at this hour of the morning, but most of us are capable of rational thought. And, and all of this means in, in a sense then that we have been in, invested with an immortal soul. Now, there are a number of passages in the scriptures that make it clear that this dignity and this image um, are not bestowed at birth, but that they're bestowed in the womb. And we know these passages well, but it's good to ponder them within this context. So Jeremiah, the, that all-important uh, uh, prophet, is told by God, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. That's pretty significant. The powerful and, and certainly very inspired Psalm 139, that again, we, we all know well, truly you have formed my inmost being. You knit me in my mother's womb. I give you thanks that I am wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul also you knew full well, nor was my frame unknown to you. When I was made in secret, when I was fashioned in the depths of the earth. And so we get this sense that, that this that, that, that we are unique and that we are given a mission by God before we're even born. And of course, kind of the, the maybe the, the, the grand finale in a sense, um, the most uh, poignant proclamation, I guess, of the dignity of, of human life probably comes from the visitation. Mary's visit to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth cries out to Mary in that first chapter of Luke's Gospel, saying, Most blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how does this happen to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For the moment the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the infant in my womb leapt for joy. And so Elizabeth calls Mary the, the mother of my Lord. Um, and that Lord is only very newly conceived because it says that Mary went in haste from the Annunciation to the Visitation. What does haste mean? She was there in two days? Maybe she's there in two weeks? But already that reality within her womb is something that John and Elizabeth's womb recognized, leapt for joy over, and Elizabeth is calling her the mother of my Lord. And so uh, it seems that uh, the picture uh, is clear. Now, to, from a little bit of a different angle, 
Uh, this picture that we're painting here needs to include uh, Jesus' public ministry, right? I mean, th that would make plenty of sense. And I think that, um, you know, I, I often encourage people to do this, to, to just pick up a Bible and read through one of the Gospels somewhat quickly. I mean, just kind of look through a whole Gospel. And I think that you will be shocked with the amount of time and energy and love that Jesus pours into those who are on the fringe of the world and of society. The sick, the handicapped, the sinners, the outcast, those on death row, like the good thief. And it's, it's amazing how much time Jesus spends with them. And often heals them, sometimes physically, always spiritually. But what this seems to make very clear is that these people are no less precious than anybody else on this earth, right? No less precious. And that on some level you almost get the sense that, not, that they are not more precious, but they are they are extremely precious to Christ. How can they not be precious to us? So I think the sacred scriptures are very clear. Each human life is unique and sacred from conception. And that we are not the authors of human life. God is. And that as a consequence, we don't have a right to take human life unless it's self-defense. And that this message is clear and consistent and not changeable. Now, I would like to note that uh, the preamble to the, our U.S. Constitution recognizes many of these truths. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, created equal, right? That they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so all men are created by God, and all men are equal in dignity. And that all men are endowed by their creator with rights, the first of which is life. Now, we know that many in our society, you know, don't get this, don't understand it, don't appreciate it for lots and lots and lots of reasons. Uh, but so often the lives of others are considered a burden, and they may be a burden. And their quality of life does not match what we think it should be. Or maybe they're just simply angry at the moment and they feel they have a right to take someone's life. And again, as Christians, we believe that God alone is the author of that life. And we don't have that right. Now, three of the common practices that are accepted in many corners of our society today are are abortion and the death penalty and euthanasia. And, um, you know, one of the ones that, that's, that's really continues to be debated these days is, uh, is the death penalty. And, and the Catholic Church uh, has a long history of allowing the death penalty and more recently has been uh, uh, stating that in those countries where uh, the penal system and the law system are set up so that the society is capable, truly capable, of protecting people from dangerous criminals, that then we, uh, we don't need the death penalty anymore. And that we, uh, when, it, when, when we do have that capacity, in most of the countries of the Western world at this point, um, we should not use the death penalty. And this is, this is a movement, and, and this became very clear uh, with uh, Pope John Paul II um, in Evangelium Vitae, which was a very important uh, document. And then it's very clear in the Catechism as well. 
And I, I, I want to share with you just an example of one of the reasons why the church uh, thinks it's so important to leave this in God's hands. And it's a great story of St. Maria Goretti. I think a lot of you probably would know that story. But uh, she was uh, just a, a beautiful young woman who was stabbed to death by uh, a man named Alexander, who was a neighbor, because she refused his advances. And uh, she appeared to him in jail and gave him a number of roses. And evidently that number of roses corresponded to the exact number of stab wounds that he used to kill her. And this dream began a conversion, a real conversion, a true conversion of heart. And after 27 years in prison, he was actually released from prison. And he was at her beatification in Rome with her mother. And he spent the rest of his life in a monastery um, doing penance for his sins. Now, again, I, I, letting criminals who have killed others out of prison, that's a bit of a different story. But, but the point is that, uh, you know, he went through a conversion in a certain sense in God's time. And it was a real conversion. And this is part of uh, the idea here, is that, uh, you know, we need to put dangerous people into prison, and I think that we should do that for life, but we let God determine when they go home. And we know, you know, that Jesus preaches forgiveness for, for all criminals, and did so on uh, the cross. And so... Now, another issue is, is, uh, is euthanasia, <coughs> where it's very common these days to desire to, to supposedly put people out of their misery. And again, this flies in the face of the church's understanding of, of the cross, of the role of suffering in this world, um, and how Christ has redeemed suffering. I mean, there's all kinds of things that we can say. But, but I, I want to give another very personal example. So my father suffered from COPD, uh, a very debilitating lung disease. And it made the last five years of his life uh, filled with incredible limitations and frustrations. Everywhere he went, he had to carry an oxygen tank. And it, it just was not a lot of fun. And he surprisingly lasted three years after my mother passed away from the same disease. Um, in his last months, my sister, uh, Winnie, moved in with him to take care of him. And it was amazing how many graces flowed from that. For the two of them, for their relationship, for the family. And in his last month, I had a series of conversations with, uh, with my dad about God that, that we had struggled to have for most of our lives. And um, my dad grew up in the Episcopal Church and uh, certainly, obviously, allowed us to grow up in the Catholic Church. And he, he really stopped going to the Episcopal Church. And when he went to church, he came to the Catholic Church, but he... He uh, was not super regular, and, uh, and I know that he struggled uh, with, with the church, and, and uh, I didn't know a lot about his relationship with God. But uh, he and I ended up having some really good conversations at the end. And in the end, um, he wanted me to anoint him. And in the end... Um, he wanted to be buried in the Catholic Church, knowing that the bishop would likely be there. And he was buried in the church, and Bishop Laverde presided at that celebration. And, you know, if for whatever reason we had decided as a family that this kind of suffering was just too much, and we decided that we were going to end this a while ago, 
we would have kept all that from happening. So again, the, the U.S. bishops exhort us to be not afraid and to be courageous and bold in proclaiming the truth that all human life is sacred from the moment of conception to natural death. Each person is a unique image of the divine life and each is deserving of love and respect. This is a, a, a challenging truth of our faith as Christians, uh, but I believe it's one of the, the many ways in which we need uh, the laity to stand up in the world and to believe and to speak this truth and to be eleven in this world. Thank you and God bless you. <laughs>